Hi, my name is Chongwen Chung, and I'm a professor at Yonsei University. Welcome to the course Introduction to TCP IP. This course includes five major chapters, and they are listed right here. My PC's Internet and Gateway, TCP IP Protocol, Internet Routing and Functions, Internet Security, Wireshark Internet Project. In the first chapter, My PC's Internet and Gateway, it talks about how your PC is connected to the internet and what are the basic configurations. This is the best way to learn how the internet actually works. So therefore, I use that as a tool for you to see how your computer is connected to the internet, which you've been using every day. So we start off with My PC's Internet Setup. Then we go into the second one, which is the Automatic Internet Setup using DHCP, which is the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Then the IP gateway and router configuration. And then based on that configuration, we're going to see how the IP routing table is set up and then how it's used. When a packet comes into the router or the gateway, how is that routing table used to find which way to send it out? For example, in this chapter, we will go into the actual configuration setup in your personal computer. We will look at these options that are set up and this is basically how you use your internet. What do these numbers mean? What do these options that are selected, what do they mean? I'll teach you all about that. In addition, we'll study about routers. And we'll study about this example, which has four different connections to four different interfaces that are used on the gateway, on the router. Inside, there is a routing table in the middle. And we're connecting a large number of computers where we have four different rooms connecting a total of 175 computers. And then one interface port is connected to the internet. How do you set up a basic routing table? And how does it work when a packet comes in to search down this information to decide where it's going to be sent out by the router? Now, every computer, every PC that exists is connected to a default router. Now, in that default router, how is that set up? That's basically what we're going to study about because your PC sends all of its packets to that default router to connect to the internet or other computers. And every packet that you receive on your personal computer or laptop computer comes from that default router to you. So that router is so important. So that's why we're going to study about how it all works in very simple terms. Then, in the TCP IP protocol lecture, we're going to study about the OSI 7 layer model and the TCP IP 5 layer model. Also, network operations and the TCP IP layers. What and how do they work? In addition, what are their networking functions? As well as, we'll study some details on IPv4 and IPv6, which also include the CIDR notation, which is classless interdomain routing. And in addition, we'll study on the protocol structure of UDP and TCP. For example, the TCP IP protocol structure five layer model is over there. And corresponding to each layer, these are the protocols and their functions that we have. And as you can see down there, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and 3G, as well as 4G, LT communications, these are the options that we've been always using. So therefore, it's time to learn how this all works together. Then, in the next chapter about internet routing and functions, we'll study about IGP and EGP, which include BGP4 protocol. We'll study about the OSPF routing technology, then ARP, NAT, RPC, FTP, and email technology. For example, in this chapter, one of the things that we'll study about is the OSPF shortest path tree routing. And this is the routing technology that is used in the internet. So you've been using it your entire life. You might as well know a little bit about how it actually works. And that's what this course is about. Then we'll go into internet security. It's so important. So there are so many security attacks and there's so many defense technologies. So which ones should we look into first? Well, we'll go off of the ones that are the top ranking, the most famous ones of all. We'll start off with the ranking table itself, and then we'll see what is actually going on. Then, what are the growing security and threat issues that we need to look into? 
Then we'll go into internet and cyber attacks where, where we will cover phishing, denial of service, DOS, distributed denial of service, overflow, man in the middle attacks, and SQL injection type techniques. Now, we will also look into internet security and protection techniques, which include firewall, intrusion detection system, IDS, TLS, WP, and secure shell technology. For example, just looking at the ranking of the most frequent types of attacks that occur over the internet, we'll study about these in this list order of importance. Then, to wrap this course up, we have a very easy project that we're going to be doing together, and that is Wireshark Internet Project. First, I'm going to show you how to install Wireshark, and then how to check your IP configuration on your computer. Now, this function of IP config and using your command window, these type of things have been always on your computer. And now, you'll get to learn how to use them. And then, using the Wireshark program that we installed, we're going to use it to analyze the overall internet connections that we've been using so far. For example, one snapshot of a Wireshark capture of actual action that's going on through the internet connection and your PC is something that's demonstrated here, where you can see the source IP address, destination IP address, including the TCP handshake, which is a handshake operation like this. In addition, the TLS security handshake operations down there are also shown. And we will be making connections and actually downloading a file from a Google Drive or a Baidu Drive, and that will be the test experiment that we will do. So therefore, these are the contents included in this course, Introduction to TCP IP, and I welcome you to join me in this course. Thank you very much. This lecture is on my PC's internet setup, and the focus here is to understand the internet connection and the operations of TCP IP through the computer that you always use to connect to the internet. When you look into the control panel, you can see the networking and sharing center listed down there. If you click on it, you'll be able to go and in control the configuration that connects you to the internet. Now, I'm using a Windows-based operating system on this computer that I used to prepare this lecture. In case you're using a different type of computer that has a different operating system, then the interface to the control panel for internet setup is going to be a little bit different. However, the basic values and the way to set it up is actually the same. So therefore, if you look through it a little bit and listen to this lecture, you'll be able to know exactly what and how to do things the right way. Now, if you click on the networking and sharing center icon down there, you'll be able to see the network connection inside. And here is the Ethernet connection that you see. If you click on that, you'll be able to get the window over there. Now, on that side, you can look at the internet connection, which has the TCP and IPv4. It's already selected in blue. If you go and click that, then the window that you see right here opens up. Now, in this window, the option on the top here is the DHCP which is this right here, the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Now, we're going to study about that in the next lecture. But first, we're going to go into the manual mode correction uh, control mode, which is listed down here. So I'm going to go and select this and actually look at how these values right here are actually set up and what they mean to your connection of the PC to the internet. Now. Let's look at the IP address first. The PC's internet interface IP address is 165.132.126.159. And as you can see, the IPv4 32-bit address is listed here in decimal numbers. Actually, the, if you look at it, it's listed in binary numbers that were converted to these decimal numbers. Now, the 32-bit address is a combination of four bytes, and each byte is eight bits. In addition, one byte is also called one octet. So a byte and an octet are the same thing. They are each eight bits each. 
Now, an IPv4 address is 32 bits, which is 4 bytes. So, basically, with 8 bits, you can represent a number from all 8 zeros to all 8 ones. And therefore, the number would range from 0 to 255. And then, what the address does is that it has one byte and then a period, one byte and then a period, another byte and then a period, and the last byte. So therefore, you have four bytes, which are 4 bytes equals 32 bits of the entire IPv4 address. So therefore, if you were to look at the IP address assignment here, then basically, as you can see, the 165.132.126.159 would map into the binary sequence of what you see right here. And this is a binary form. And this is how we represent the IPv4 address. IP addresses are assigned to each interface. And a computer or a smartphone may have multiple interfaces, and therefore they will need multiple IP address assignments. Basically, one IP address for each interface is required. For example, I'm going to look at a smartphone here that you see, which is a Samsung Galaxy S7 Edge device. If you were to look into this device, basically it has multiple interfaces. For example, for mobile communication, it has a 2G, a 3G, and a 4G connection for mobile communication. In addition, for Wi-Fi, it has the other connections, which are basically for the IEEE 802.11, A, B, G, N, and AC modes. And these support the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequency ranges. In addition, for Bluetooth, 4.2 is also on this mobile device. So therefore, each of the interfaces need a separate IP address. And that's why a single device will consume, can consume, a lot of IP addresses in order to support all of its connectivity. Now, subnet mask. The internet is divided into subnets. These are subdivisions of the overall internet. And they divide it this way so that the networks are groups that are managed together. And it helps the routing to be much more efficient and scalable. So therefore, if you look at it, the internet is divided into subnets. And subnets are divided into smaller subnets within. A subnet mask is based on the size of the subnet that the client, the PC, is connected to. An IPv4 subnet mask is formed by 32 bits, just the same length as its IP address. And you have ones or zeros in a sequence from left to right, from the left MSB to the right LSB. MSB stands for most significant bit. The LSB stands for the least significant bit. Now, the subnet mask is used to filter the IP address such that you can easily determine if this packet belongs to this subnet or not. For example, let's look at this window down here. And it has a subnet mask. The number that you see is listed <clears throat> above here. It is 255.255.252.0. Change that into binary, and this is what you have. Here, you can see the series of all the ones, and then you can see the zeros right here. There are 10 zeros right in a sequence. Now, the subnet mask can be used to find the subnet size. In this example, we have 10 zeros down here. So therefore, 2 to the power of 10 equals 1,024. So in this subnet, there are 1,024 IP addresses included in. Now, but not all IP addresses are going to be used for individual PCs. Some of them are actually may you be used for the internet connection itself, as well as some actually may not be used. They may be reserved for future use, and if they are not used in the future, well, then they're going to be wasted. Now, we'll look into this issue a little bit later in this chapter when we go into actual IP subnetting of our own and we solve a problem to set up the routing table. The details are in there, so just wait a little bit. Next, we're going to look into this part, which is the default gateway. The default gateway address is, is, is listed down there. 
The default gateway is the dedicated internet router that will send and receive all internet packets for this PC. So basically, if you know your PC the way it's set up, in addition, if you know how the, your default gateway is set up, basically your connection to the internet is exclusively explained all of its functions through this. So therefore, knowing this makes you very powerful when it comes down to your TCP IP knowledge. So therefore, that's the focus of this chapter, and we'll get deeper into it. Now, as you can see, the PC will access the internet through this gateway. All packets that is sent and received at this PC is going to go through that gateway. That is why it's called the default gateway. It's default. And by definition, all gateways are IP routers. So that's why you're going to see me use the word router and gateway interchangeably. Okay. In the window over here, you can see that use the following DNS server address. And there is a preferred DNS server and an alternate DNS server IP address. What do these do? DNS stands for Domain Name Server. And it's a server that converts host names into IP addresses. A host name example would be for like if you're an email user that uses Gmail, then the ID, your email ID, with at gmail.com, then the gmail.com would be the host name. For a website example, well, www.facebook.com, then that facebook.com would be the host name. DNS operates this way. It converts the www.facebook.com into an IP address. Now, we need the IP address in order to route the packet to the server such that the server can respond back with the information that we want. Now, as I just explained, there is a preferred DNS server, which is the main one, and then there's a alternate DNS server, which is the backup one. And these two support your connectivity by changing domain names into IP addresses. In this lecture, we're going to study about automatic internet setup using DHCP, which is Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Now, when you go and select that icon on the top, which is the automatic mode, basically you're selecting DHCP. It's not written DHCP, but that's the technology that makes it possible. Basically, what are you going to do? Well, in the former lecture, you saw all the functions of what is in here, all these numbers that we have in here, what they do, and how they help the internet connection. Basically, DHCP does all of those automatically. It receives all of this information in here automatically from a DHCP server in the local network. Now, DHCP enables a computer or a smartphone to automatically contact the local DHCP server and request for an IP address, networking parameters, to connect to the internet. Now, first, the requirements are a local DHCP server must exist. Just because you clicked on that button does not necessarily mean that you're going to get DHCP services. You have to have a local DHCP server supporting you. If you have it and you click on it, then everything automatically will happen. Next. When DHCP is used, setup is automatic. There is no need to contact the local network administrator to have the internet connection set up manually. In addition, this is why mobile devices commonly use DHCP. In addition, DHCP is used for IPv4 and IPv6 connections. Now, DHCP services are used to enable internet access the DHCP server dynamically assigns the following information as the IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, as well as the DNS server's IP address. And there's more to it. Now, the importance of DHCP? Well, DHCP is so easy to use. It's all automatic. It's wonderful. And DHCP enables reuse of IP addresses. So if there's a pool of IP addresses, then it can dynamically assign. And when the service is, is no longer needed, take it back and reuse these IP addresses very effectively. So 
with a small number of IP addresses, you can serve a lot of people based upon their needs when they need it. Now, only a computer or a smartphone that needs internet connection at that time is assigned an IP address to use. After the internet connection ends, well, that IP address is returned back to the server and someone else can use it. So therefore, it is very effective for some nets. Reuse of IP addresses is especially important for IPv4 networks because there is a shortage of IPv4 addresses. Why? Well, it's like this. An IPv4 address is 32 bits. So if you see how many possible address combinations you can come up with, well, 2 to the power of 32 is a number that is slightly less than 4.3 billion, which means that you have less than 4.3 billion IP addresses. But then again, a lot of the devices like today that we have, for like your smartphone, like I shown you earlier, it has multiple interfaces. And therefore, even a single device may need multiple IP addresses. And later on, as I'll show you, in addition, the network needs a destination address. The broadcasting will need a separate IP address. And also, the router interfaces will also need IP address assignments. So therefore, much more IP addresses are needed. And therefore, basically, we already have more than 4.3 IP address needs. So therefore, there is already an, exhaust, an exhausting problem that we're running out of IPv4 addresses. And DHCP helps magnificent, magnificently in this aspect. Now, currently there are much more than 4.3 billion. So therefore, this becomes very important. This is why DHCP is needed. In addition, that is one of the major reasons we needed to change to IPv6, such that we had not a 32-bit, but a 128-bit address, which gives us much more address combinations, such that we will not run out of IP addresses in the near future. DHCP operations are the next thing we need to look into. Now, DHCP operates on a client-server model. The client is your PC, your laptop computer, your smartphone. And the server is the DHCP server. Now, the basic operation is that the DHCP server manages a pool of IP addresses. In addition, client information, which include default gateway, domain name, name servers, and time servers. The way that the setup message and the operation works is, first, the client connects to the network. Then, DHCP uses UDP to find the DHCP server. The client DHCP program broadcasts a server discovery message requesting for network information. Any DHCP server on the network can provide service by replying an IP lease offer message to the client. And then the client will send an IP lease request back to the DHCP server. That DHCP server will send back an IP lease acknowledgement enabling use of an IP address and network parameters for a limited time duration. If we were to summarize the operations between the client device, which is your smartphone, your PC, your laptop computer, then how does it work with the DHCP server? Well, first step is server discovery. Next step is IP lease offer comes back from the DHCP server. And then an IP lease request is made to the server, and an IP lease acknowledgement conceals the agreement such that the operations are now in work. Next, we look at when a client tries to reconnect to the internet, what happens? If a computer or a smartphone needs an IP address again, the DHCP server tries to give the same IP address that was used before by that computer or that smartphone. However, that may not always be the case. A different IP address may be assigned if that IP address is being used by some other device or due to the network administrator's assignment regulations. In other words, we may prevent giving a device the same IP address just for security reasons or something like, something like that. 
And therefore, we really don't know what's going to happen until we really look into the DHCP server policies of how it's actually managed. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to look into the IP gateway and router configuration. And we're going to focus on the IP address assignment and subnet and subnet mask setup part. Thank you. In this lecture, we're going to study about IP gateway and router configuration. Now, IP network requirements. Configure the gateway, the router, routing table to support the following network setup. Basically, we're going to learn how to set up an IP routing table through an actual experiment where we actually set up based upon network requirements. Think of it like this. Room A, B, C, and D are like, these are like computer rooms, computer labs. And we need to set up a router where we can connect all these PCs such that these individual computer labs can all have access to each other as well as send and receive packets through the internet. For our gateway, we're going to assume that we have four ports that we're going to use. Now, a larger gateway could have, of course, more ports. However, it has four ports that we're going to use. And it's going to be port 1, 2, 3, 4, as you see right here, where for room A, there's 100 PCs inside. And we're going to connect port 1, the interface 1 of the gateway to it. For room B, there are 25 PCs inside that room. And we're going to connect that to the interface 2 of the gateway. And then for room C and D, they're connected to a switch or a hub right here. And they each have 25 computers inside. They're connected to this switch or hub. And then that is connected over there to interface port number 3 of the gateway. The internet is connected to the interface number 4 right here, as you see below. We're going to, we're going to go and set up that routing table that's in the middle, that's in the middle of the gateway, the router. And by that, I think that you'll have a real good understanding of the subnet, IP addresses, and the other configurations about how the network, how the internet actually works. So here we go. First, we're going to subnet the IP network. And like I said, we have four rooms, A, B, C, D. And we're going to subnet off of this, which is 165.132.9.0. And we're going to use 256 IP addresses to do that. That's what was given to us by the network administrator. Now, the gateway connects these four rooms and the internet. In addition, room A has 100 computers and connects to interface number one of the gateway. Room B has 25 computers and connects to interface port number two of the gateway. The room C and D connected to a hub and switch, each having 25 computers each, and they connect to interface 3 of the gateway. And all PCs need to have connection and internet access, and that is connected through interface 4 of the gateway. And the internet connection that we see has a port connection where it is 165.132.15.56 with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.252. And the subnet mask is also called the net mask. Now, for this configuration, given the information of the IP address to use and how many addresses we were given to subnet off of, well, the range that we get to use is this. Basically, from 165.132.9.0, all the way to 165.132.9.255. From 0 to 255 is 256 IP addresses. Now, we're going to look into subnet for room A. In subnet for room A, we said that we had 100 computers, and each of them need an IP address. So I need 100 IP addresses. In addition, you will see that for this subnet of room A, you also need a network destination, an IP address for rep to represent this subnet altogether. And basically, so therefore, I need one IP address for that. In addition, 
for this entire subnet for room A, what I also need is I need one IP address to be used for broadcasting. So therefore, if I need to send a packet to all of these IP addresses, all of these interfaces that are in the subnet for room A, then I need an address for that. In addition, I also need a, an address, IP address, for the gateway's interface number one, which this room is going to be connected to. Because it's an interface, it needs an IP address assignment. So therefore, these are the IP addresses uh, that I need. Add them up together, there's 103. Now, I'm going to look at the subnet size, and this is where we look into some number comparing. I need 103 IP addresses, and the subnet sizes are always 2 to the power represented numbers. In other words, 2 to the power 1, 2 to the power 2, 2 to the power 3, and going up and up and up. Now, I need to find the smallest subnet size that can fit in 103 IP addresses. If you look that up, the smallest number is 2 to the power of 7, which is 128. It's a lot larger than 103, but it's still the smallest number. If I go to 2 to the power of 6, then I cannot contain 103. So therefore, 2 to the power of 7 is a number I have to use. It's a lot larger than 103, and we'll soon see the effect of what this means. Now, if you look at the subnet mask here, then 2 to the power of 7 is what we were going to use, which is 128. 2 to the power of 7 means that the subnet mask will have, the 32-bit subnet mask will have the last 7 bits assigned as 0, and the rest will be 1. So therefore, the subnet mask will be 255.255.255.128. Now, for these IP addresses, what we're going to do is, the lowest IP address will be assigned to the network destination. The highest IP address in this subnet will be assigned for the broadcast IP. The second highest IP address in the subnet will be assigned to the gateway interface number one. Now, if you look at this structure, as you can see, well, the IP address for room A will be off of 165.132.9. That star right there. Now, what's going to go into that star? Is that star is that. These are the numbers that are going to go into that star position. The zero, which is the lowest number among the range of numbers I have, will be used as the network destination. Then, I had 100 computers from 1 to 100, so I'm going to use 100 IP addresses, one for each PC. And then, I'm going to go to the bottom right here, the broadcast IP. I'm going to use the highest number and assign that to the broadcast IP address. And then the second highest one will be used as a gateway interface number one IP address. Then, in the middle, in the middle, from 101 to 125, in what you see as this underlined gray numbers, well, these are the IP addresses that are reserved for future use. You can assign additional computers using them. However, if they're not assigned, then yes, they will be wasted. This is why subnetting makes the internet extremely scalable and very, very effective and efficient to manage and operate. However, the subnetting architecture does result in some wasted IP addresses. Next, we need 103, but we got 128 as the subnet size that we could use. And therefore, the subnet size was assigned like this. Now, there is a notation called CIDR, which is classless inter-domain inter routing. And this technology gives an assignment mechanism where we can write up the network destination and the subnet mask all together in one notation. And that is what you see right here. In other words, the network destination is the address, which you see right there, 165.132.9.0. And then the subnet mask, how many ones were in the subnet mask? Now, we already said on the former page that there's going to be seven zeros in the subnet mask. Since it's altogether 32 bits, that means that there are 25 bits right here that are all ones that are in the subnet mask. So therefore, we will represent it as with a slash 25, as you see down there at the bottom. That is the CIDR notation for this network.
Now, let's go to subnet for room B. Room B had 25 PCs inside. So one IP address for each computer. Here we go. 25 is needed. We need a network destination for the subnet of room B. We need broadcast IP address. We need a gateway interface IP address for interface number two of the gateway. Now, so therefore, altogether, I need 28. OK, what is the right subnet size? Here we go. I need a number that is larger than 28, but I'm looking for the smallest number that will fit in 28, but is also a number that can be represented by 2 to the power of a number. And that number is 2 to the power of 5 which is 32. 32 is larger than 28, so it fits it well. Now, representing that in a subnet way, 2 to the power of 5 means that the subnet mask 32 bits will have five zeros at the end. So therefore, the subnet mask will be 255.255.255.224. And the lowest IP address in the subnet will be assigned to the network destination for room B subnet. The highest IP address in the subnet will be assigned for broadcasting IP to all the IP addresses in rooms B, in room B's subnet. The second high, highest IP address will be assigned to the gateway interface number two. Now, based upon this, you can see that the IP addresses assigned will be off of 165.132.9. That red star. And the number that we're going to put in that red star is these numbers right here. The lowest one is 128, because from 0 to 127, we've already used that for room A, that subnet over there. So since we used that number, we need to start from 128 here, which is for room B. So we start with the lowest number, 128. That's the network destination for this subnet of room B. and then. For the 25 PCs, we assign one IP address for each one of them. So that's going to consume the last numbers of 129 to 153. And then the highest number is used for broadcasting. That's 159. The second highest number is used for the gateway interface IP address port number 2 on the router. So we need that. Then, once again, well, I needed 28 IP addresses, but the subnet size that was assigned was 32. So unfortunately, well, I have four reserved, four unused IP addresses that are reserved for future use or maybe wasted if they're not eventually used. Now, the CIDR notation used can be represented like this. Once again, the number of ones in the subnet mask is 27. So therefore, using the network destination address that ends with a dot 128, it goes down there, which is 165.132.9.128 slash 27. And that's the CIDR network ID notation. Then we go and we look into room C and D. First of all, C and D each had 25 computers each. Add them up together, that gives us 50. So I have 50 over here. And then the likewise, for rooms C and D combined together, their network destination will need one IP address. The broadcasting will need one IP address for this specific subnet. And also, the interface on the gateway, which is port 3, will also need one IP address. Once again, every interface, every communication interface, needs a separate IP address assigned to it. So look at the router. All of the interfaces need individual IP addresses, and that's what we're preparing. Combine them all up together, we get 53. Now, what is the right subnet size? Once again, the subnet size has to be represented as a power of 2. So 2 to the power of something. So what will fit 53? What is the smallest subnet size that will fit 53 inside? And that will be 2 to the power of 6, which is 64. So 2 to the power of 6 means that if I look at the subnet mask, the 32 bits of the subnet mask, the last 6 bits will be the zeros. So therefore, the subnet mask will result in 255.255.255.192. Those 6 zeros at the end are opening up the mask so that these ranges of IP addresses 
can be filtered, can be masked, masked through by this. So what do you do? Well, basically, the network destination and the subnet mask will give the range of IP addresses that belong to this subnet for room C and D. Now, the lowest IP address in the subnet will be used for the network destination for the subnet of room C and D. For room C and D to broadcast on this subnet, I will use the highest IP address. And also, in, among the numbers in this subnet, I will use the second highest IP address for the gateway interface number three. Now, the numbers will be assigned in this star once again, and the numbers are these numbers right here. So the network destination is the lowest number. I start at 160 because what I did was up to 159 was used by room A and room B. So I start with 160 from here. 160 is the lowest number, so it's the network destination address used for this subnet of room C and D. Next, I had 25 and 25 in each room, so these two combined together are 50, so I'm going to use 50 IP addresses for each of these 50 computers. In addition, I'm going to use the highest address for broadcasting, the second highest one for the gateway interface number three. Then, in the middle, I have 11 reserved, this gray underlined range of numbers. They are unused. And once again, they are reserved. That's a good way to put it. On the other way, if they're not used, well, they're wasted. And we can see, why is this? It, once again, it's because we needed 53, but we had to go with 64. So therefore, that resulted in these many 11 uh, IP addresses that are contained within this subnet that are not used currently. Now, we may need to assign an IP address for the hub, the switch, in some cases. In this example, it was not required, so therefore I didn't. But in some cases, we may need to. In that case, then, as you look right here, the highest IP address was for the broadcast. The second highest one was for the gateway interface, port number three. Then another one among these 11, this, the next highest one, I will assign that to the hub or the switch. Or the hub may be the switch. Well, whatever it is for them. If I needed two coming in from each side, then I will use two among these 11 that I have right here. I have these left over, and I'm not using them, so I might as well use that for them, if the switch needed it. Now, now we're going to go into the IP routing table in the next lecture. And there we'll be looking into two components. Number one, how to set up the routing table based upon all this information we just studied in this lecture. And then, if a packet comes into the router, the gateway, how is it filtered down such that it goes out one of the interface ports? We'll study that in the next lecture. Thank you. For the course, Introduction to TCP IP, this course is about the TCP IP protocol. First, we'll study about the OSI and the TCP IP models. Now, comparing the OSI 7 layer model and the TCP IP 5 layer model, you can see their layer structures over there. And in the OSI 7 layer model, it has the application layer, presentation layer, session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer, and the physical layer at the bottom. In the TCP IP 5 layer model, you can see the application layer, transport layer, internet layer, network access layer, and the physical layer at the bottom. And corresponding to the TCP IP 5 layer model, you can see the following functions that are connected. Now, first, at the application layer, you can see Telnet, FTP, SMTP, DNS, and others. Then at the transport layer, you can see TCP and UDP. At the internet layer, you can see IP, which is the IPv4 and IPv6, which we use now these days. Then at the network access layer down here, you can see Ethernet and other protocols, including Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Then at the physical layer, you can see the physical connectivity interface requirements standardized there at the lowest layer. Now let's look into the OSI 7 layer model. Here, this model is used to characterize and standardize communication functions of a telecommunication or computing system. The OSI stands for the Open System Interconnection. This was 
the original model was released in 1983 under the name of the Basic Reference Model. Then it was standardized in 1984 as the ISO 7498 standards. Currently, it is under the ITU-T standards, which is numbered under X.200. Here the ITU-T stands for the International Telecommunication Union, Telecommunication Standardization Sector. Now, for the TCP-IP5 layer model, it's a simpler model compared to the OSI-7 layer model. And it was developed for the United States Department of Defense packet switching network called ARPANET. And therefore, it's call also called the DOD model. Now, the ARPANET planning initiated in 1968, and it was used and it was decommissioned in 1990. It was declared as the United States Department of Defense standard for all military computer networking in 1982, and it was widely used. Currently, it's maintained by the IETF under the IAB. Now let's look at the TCP IP network operations. First, we're going to take a look at an application file transfer example. The application on computer H1, which is host1, creates a user data file that needs to be transferred to computer H5. And that's this application data file. The application data file is divided into payload segments based on the maximum transfer unit, the MTU size of the IP packet and the Ethernet frame size requirements. And that creates a payload segment, multiple payload segments that need to be transferred. Then TCP header is added to the data segment. And H1 and H5 set up a TCP session using a three-way handshake. The three-way handshake is based upon the TCP units of H1 and H5, where, based on the time flowing from top to bottom, you can see that H1 will send a SYN syn message to H5, which represents, let's synchronize. Then as reply, H5 will, H5 will acknowledge the synchronization message and send back a synchronization message of itself to synchronize in the opposite direction, from H5 to H1. Then H1 will acknowledge that synchronization by sending back an acknowledgment. The TCP flow and error control is only controlled by end-to-end -end H1 and H5 devices. It is not controlled by the routers in between. Then the IP header is added to form an IP packet. IPv4 and IPv6 have different IP headers. The IP header includes the source address and the destination address. The IPv4 address is 32 bits, and the IPv6 address is 128 bits. Then the Ethernet header and trailer are added to the IP packet. The Ethernet header and trailer are used by Ethernet switches. Ethernet switches will conduct flow and air control. Other protocols, such as Wi-Fi, will use their own protocol header and trailer. And you can see the red parts are indicated at the header, which is larger than the trailer, which is very narrow, so therefore it's drawn very narrow. Now, the intermediate routers, routers 1, 2, and 3, R1, R2, and R3, use the IP addresses to route IP packets. Routers use routing tables to determine where to send the packets. Optimal routing paths are set up using routing algorithms. Then, the Ethernet frame is received at H5's network interface card, which is NIC for short. The Ethernet header and trailer are used to detect errors in the frame. If an error is detected, then the frame is discarded and the frame retransmission is requested. The Ethernet header and trailer are removed to reveal the IP packet. The IP packet header contains many network control functions, which are checked. For example, the ECN, Explicit Congestion Notification. Now, the IP header is removed to reveal the TCP header. 
TCP will control the window size to increase or decrease the data transfer rate. TCP includes the port address that connects the data to H5's application X. Then, the TCP header is removed to reveal the payload segment. Now, the payload segments are combined to reconstruct the application data file. And then the application data file is delivered to application X. Now, this is how H1's application data file is transferred to H5 through TCP IP networking, as you can see like this here. And in the next lecture, I'll give you more details about how this works. Thank you. In this lecture, we're going to study about the TCP IP layers. And we're going to use a comparison of how we actually send mail to show how the TCP IP protocol works. First, the TCP IP 5 layer model, as we've already studied. And over there, you can see an email file that's need to be sent through Wi-Fi connected to the internet to this one over here, which is another computer that's connected to Ethernet. First, let's start at the application layer. And I want to send many books to my friend by mail. And these are the books that I want to send. You can think of the books as the application data file. Then, at the transport layer, it will divide the books into boxes and number the boxes for mailing. Now, the boxes are the TCP payload segments. And also, the box numbering represents the TCP sequence numbers. For example, the first box out of the three, the second box out of the three, and this is the last box out of the three. When received at the destination, the box numbers will be used to find any missing boxes and also reorder the books into the proper sequence. And that's what the TCP does. Then the IP layer will add sender and receiver addresses on each box, like you see down here. The sender address is like the source IP address, and the receiver address is like the destination IP address. IP addresses are used to deliver the packet to the receiver, where the delivering process is the routing, and the receiver is indicated in the receiver, the destination address. IPv4 addresses are 32 bit long, and IPv6 addresses are 128 bits long. Then comes what we need to select, the mail type, which is like air mail, surface mail, priority mail, and other things. And that's like selecting the network access layer. For example, these are the types. That would mean that in the actual networking, we would be selecting between satellite communication, mobile communication, optical fiber communication, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and other type of communication protocols. Then, at the physical layer, the physical layer is like selecting the airplane, the ship, based upon airmail and seamail and other options that we selected at layer two. So therefore, we have wired, wireless, and optical components. And this here is the way that we move files from XX to YY to different locations through TCP IP protocol. Further details will follow in the next lecture. Thank you. In this lecture, we're going to study about TCP IP networking functions. First, we're going to start with the application layer. Communication of application and services between separate computers and hosts is what's accomplished. The transport layer is to provide port delivery to the application at the destination computer and more. You can see that TCP and UDP are the main protocols that are used, but there are other transport protocols as well. Then comes the internet, the IP protocol layer. And here what you can see is that the word internet comes from the word internetworking. Now, this enables a packet to go through multiple different interconnected networks. And it supports addressing and routing functions throughout these different multi-hop networks. For example, as you can see right here in this network, there is an Ethernet network way over there, 
connected to a Wi-Fi network in the middle. And also, you can see a point-to-point -point protocol, which is also indicated down there, that's connected to the Ethernet network right here. Now, in going through the routers down there, which are router 1, router 2, and router 3, basically, the IP layer is what makes these different networks transferable, such that an IP packet can go through, go through, go through, and be routed to reach the destination that it's intended. Then comes the network access layer. And layer 2 provides communication within a single type of network. So therefore, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, mobile communication would be those types. Within a network, it provides device addressing, priority control, error control, and flow control. Now, in local area networks, basically, this device address that we call, this will be sometimes called the MAC address, where MAC stands for medium access control. As you can see in the physical layer, this is where the physical interface of devices and network to support signal sending and receiving are specified. In this, it typically includes like the medium and the channel characteristics and the modem, which are modulator and demodulator, word combined, and then the antenna. Now, for the medium and channel, this is talking about wired, wireless, optics, acoustics, and other signals. Then we have the modem, which is dealing with RF, millimeter, microwave, light, infrared, and other signal types. And then there's the antenna, which is actually going to send and receive typical signals. Now, in the antenna side, you can think about single antenna, multiple antennas, directional, omnidirectional antennas, and other categories are included. Now, for one example, in the physical layer, what is specified? Well, for Ethernet, which we use a lot, you can think of, like the Ethernet cable. This is the Cat5, the Category 5 cable. And then it has a connector at the end, which is the RJ45 connector. These type of things have to be specified down to the details in order to make them work and use the standard protocol such that various other devices can all use the equipment that are provided from various vendors. These are the references that I use, and I recommend them to you. In this lecture, we'll study about IPv4 protocol. First, a little bit on protocol terminology. One octet is one byte, which equals 8 bits. So an octet and a byte are the same thing. A word is a group of multiple bits. You will see 16-bit word or a 32-bit word and things like that in the protocol descriptions. In addition, a flag is a 1-bit control function. And if the flag, if this 1-bit is set to 1, we say that the flag is set. And if the flag is set to 0, then we say that the flag is clear. So a flag will be used as a control function within the protocol header. These are used in IPv4, but they're also used in IPv6, TCP, and UDP, and other IETF protocols. IPv4 packet is called a datagram. And the reason is because a datagram is defined as follows. In RFC 1594, it is defined as a self-contained independent entity of data carrying sufficient information to be routed without reliance on any other earlier sent packet. So in other words, we're talking about an independent unit that has all the control features and functionalities within it, and also it can be routed independently, not depending on former packets if they were successfully routed or not. And that's the definition of a datagram, and the IP packet was designed to be that way, both IPv4 and IPv6. Looking into the packet structure, of IPv4, there is a header and a payload. The payload part will include a TCP UDP header and also the data part, which is the payload segment part. The essential functions of IPv4 are internetworking and routing. The IPv4 packet header contains all required functionalities to deliver an IPv4 packet to its destination. And that's why it was called a datagram. 
the version field tells you what version it is. And right now, we're looking at an IPv4 packet. So in the version field, it'll have the binary number of 4 included inside. And in an IPv6 packet, it'll have 6 in binary written inside. Then there's the IHL, which is the internet header length. And that's 4 bits. It's the length of an IPv4 header in words. And one word here is 4 octets, which is 32 bits. The minimum value is 5. So the header minimum length is 20 octets. Then we have the DS and ECN bits. They are combined as one byte. First, the DS, which stands for Differentiated Services field, is the first six bits. It distinguishes service priority assignments. And then we have the ECN, which is Explicit Congestion Notification. These are the two bits. Now, these are used for explicit signaling of congestion in the network to slow down the speed of packets being transmitted when there is delay or congestion that is detected within the network. Then we have the total length field, which is 16 bits. And it tells you the total length of the IP packet in units of octets. It includes the entire IP packet. Now, because we have 16 bits, the length that we can indicate with these are 2 to the power of 16 minus 1, which is 65,535 octets. Now, that's a very, very large size. But one of the things that you'll see is that we won't use that entire size, that full size. The reason is because IPv4 packet size is limited by the layer 2 frame size. For example, one of the things is the definition of MTU. It is the maximum size of an IP packet that can be transmitted without fragmentation over a medium. Now, for example, if you're using an Ethernet, well, based on the IEEE 802.3 standards, the size of the MTU is 1,500 octets. And from the positions where you can see that, from 46 minimum to 1,500 octets in the payload area is where your IP packet can go into. So therefore, in this case, the MTU for IPv4 will be 1,500 octets. In the case of Wi-Fi, which follows the IEEE 802.11 wireless local area network, wireless LAN standard, you can see that 2,304 octet maximum size MSDU, max service data unit, is the MTU. And the MPDU, which is the MAC protocol data unit, this would include the frame control, duration ID, addresses, MSDU, and the FCS, which would have this type of a structure in an overall Wi-Fi frame. Then you can see in the part where it's written as frame body, it can be for a length of 0 to 2,304 octets. And that's where the IP packet will need to fit in. So therefore, in this case, the IPv4 packet or IPv6 packet that will go into a Wi-Fi packet will have a maximum transfer unit, MTU size, of 2,304 octets. Looking into the identification field, which is 16 bits, this is a sequence number used to uniquely identify the IPv4 packet. It is used together with a source address, destination address, and the protocol field. Now, looking down here, you can see the flags and the fragment offset. This is used in packet fragmentation. It's used to divide a packet if the packet is too large to pass through a certain network. Looking into the flags, there are three bits, and only two of the three bits are actually used. The bit 0, 1 on the top is not used. It's reserved. Bit 1 is the don't fragment. And this flag is, if it's set as 1, that means do not fragment this IP packet. However, if it's set as 0, then you are allowed to fragment the packet if you need to. Then there's bit 2, which is more fragments. Now, what this does is, if you do fragment a packet, then the preceding part will have this bit set to 1, 
such that it will indicate that there is a uh, following part, there is a following fragment part that is going to come after my packet, after this packet. And that's what this is used to indicate. Then there is the fragment offset. Now, this indicates where in the original datagram does this fragment belong to. And fragments other than the last fragment must contain a data field that is a multiple of 64 bits in length. Looking down over there is the TTL, the time to live. Now, this specifies the time length in seconds that a datagram is allowed to remain in the internet. Every router that the IP packet passes through should decrease the TTL by at least one. TTL is similar to hop count in that term. And if the TTL field becomes zero before it reaches the destination, then that packet will be discarded. We then look at the protocol field. This identifies the type of the next header in the packet directly following the IPv4 header. In other words, this is the header of IPv4. Now down here, right here, is where you're going to have your next header. And then after, even below, is going to be where you have your payload data part, the payload segment part. Now, right over there, the protocol field will indicate what is the next header that's going to follow this header that ends right here. Some of the protocol options are included in this table which includes TCP and UDP, which are the most popular ones. In addition, you can see ICMP, which is Internet Control Message Protocol, and also OSPF, which is used to do the routing, routing path setup. The header checksum includes the error detection code such that the IPv4 packet header is protected. And it does not protect the payload part of the IP packet. Errors are checked by the header checksum at each router. And this is because checking is needed because the fields within the packet do change. And when they change, the header checksum is recomputed. Some of the fields that would change by hop by hop going through the routers would be like the time to live, which is consistently decreased the flags, and also the fragmentation options. Now, looking at the address fields, the source and destination address of IPv4 are each 32 bits. There is class full address where class A, B, C, D, and E do exist. However, the CIDR, which is the classless interdomain routing notation, is used much more popular now these days. Looking into the details of CIDR, this is a method to efficiently allocate IP addresses, enable and enable IP routing. It was introduced by the IETF in 1993, and it replaces the class full IP addressing used in the internet. So you will not see any more class A, B, and C type uh, classes used, rather, the CIDR notation is what dominates the IP addressing structure now these days. Why was this used? Well, the typical class ABC type these classes, they created some nets that were excessively large. And they were larger than the number of IP addresses that were needed for that subnet. Due to this reason, a lot of them had unused, reserved, wasted IP addresses. And because of this problem, a more efficient subnetting and uh, routing notation was needed. And this is why CIDR was created. It makes the internet more scalable because networks can be assigned proper subnet sizes. CIDR enables IPv4 and IPv6 address block allocations to organizations based on their actual network size and short-term predicted needs. This can be used to allocate IPv4 and IPv6 address spaces to internet service providers as well as end users. VLSM, which stands for Variable Length Subnet Masking, is a technique that the CIDR notation uses. Looking into a VLSM, 
example, you can see this, where it is 123.234.100.56 slash 24. This represents the IP address before the slash, and then the subnet mask. The subnet mask is represented by that slash 24 number that you see, which means that there are 24 ones right here, followed by the zeros that you see right here, and there are eight zeros. If we were to map them to a decimal number from the binary representation, it would be the 255.255.255.0. The subnet size can be directly obtained from this subnet mask structure because we know that the IP address is 32 bits and we have 24 ones, so that means 2 to the power of 8, which are the number of how many zeros we have right here. So that means that 256 IPv4 addresses are in this subnet. The routing prefix can also be obtained directly from the subnet and this CIDR notation. Because we know the IP address, we know that the subnet mask is 255.255.255.0. Therefore, we can directly map the two, look at where the zeros are located of the IPv4 address field, and then we can directly know that the routing prefix is the part which has the first three bytes, which is the 123.234.100. That would be the prefix part. And therefore, it ends with a dot zero at the end. For CIDR IPv4 and v6 address assignments, the IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, assigns regional internet registry, which is RIR CIDR blocks. These are assigned to countries and huge territories. These RIRs are subdivided into LIR, which are the local internet registry subnets, which are further subdivided into subnets that fit the local network size. The options field in the IPv4 header is now what we're going to look into. This includes the options requested by the sending host computer. At the end, of the option field, it also includes padding. And this is because we need to make this field right here a multiple of 32-bit words. So therefore, the padding will help to do that. These are the references that I use, and I recommend them to you. Thank you. The IPv6 protocol. IPv6 uses hexadecimal numbering, and it's represented with that OX at the front. Some examples are four bits are combined into a hexadecimal number. As you can see, the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 representation. And then coming over here, you can see the 8, 9, and then for 10, 11, 12, 13, these numbers, we have A, B, C, D, E, and F used as their representation. Changing the binary numbers to hexadecimal numbers are what you see right here. Also looking into the decimal number representation, you can see these numbers and these numbers right here. These are equivalent. The binary format, the hexadecimal format that has the OX, and then the blue letters are what we have our regular decimal number representation. In a counting sequence, in hexadecimal numbers, you will see 0 through all the way to F, listed as below. The IPv6 packet header contains all required functionalities to, to deliver an IPv6 packet to its destination, and that's why it's a datagram. The first field is the version field, and it includes the number in binary 6, listed over there, and that's because it's an IPv6 packet. The DS and ECN fields are one byte, and the DS is the differentiated service field, which comes first. It is the first six bits, and it distinguishes service priority assignments. The ECN bit, these two bits, are the explicit congestion notification, and they are used for explicit signaling of congestion in the network to slow down the speed of packets that are being transmitted. The flow label 
was originally created to provide special services to support real-time applications. However, it is currently used to inform routers and switches to not change the routing path because the reordering of the packets will be difficult at the receiver. The payload length field indicates the size of the payload in octets, and it includes the extension headers. The maximum payload size is a size that is representable using the 16 bits of the payload length field. So therefore, it is 2 to the power of 16 minus 1, which equals 65,535 octets. A much larger size of an IPv6 packet can be supported under the IPv6 jumbogram protocol, a size that is 2 to the power of 32 minus 1 octets, which is a very large size. It is approximately a, like a 4 gigabyte file size for one IPv6 packet. It provides enhanced performance over networks that can support jumbograms. In addition, when you use an IPv6 jumbogram packet, you need to use the jumbogram, the jumbo payload option extension header. The next header field is 8 bits, and it specifies the type of the next header. Some of the options are TCP and UDP. In addition, it includes the others like ICMP, ENCAP, OSPF, and other various others do exist. The extension header, well, it can be used, multiple extension headers can be added to the IPv6 header. You can add them on and use them to create the functionality within the network that you want. Each extension header has a different format but most of them follow the TLV format, which is the type length value, which may include padding as well. The extension header options are listed here, and there's many more. Among these, the ESP, which is the encapsulating security payload, and also the AH, the authentication header. These are used for IPv6 security. The hop limit is 8 bits. And this is decreased by 1 at each intermediate node that the packet passes through. The packet will be discarded when this field becomes all 0. The source and destination addresses are this field right here. They are each 128 bits. Now, the CIDR notation is used to represent these addresses. An IPv6 address is 128 bits and we can represent it as eight groups of 16 bits. The 16 bits are four hexadecimal digits. So therefore, the address representation can be eight groups with four hexadecimal digits, and four bits are represented for each hexadecimal representation. Once again, to review, the binary to the hexadecimal number to the decimal number are represented at the bottom. For an example IP address, IPv6 address was shown, is shown here, where you can see we use the colon to separate eight groups. And in each group, there are four hexadecimal numbers represented. Each hexadecimal number is four bits in binary. So therefore, between each column, we have 16 bits. Now, the address representation follows these two additional rules. Zeros in front of the four hexadecimal digits can be omitted. One or more consecutive groups of zeros may be replaced with two consecutive columns. But you can use this only once in an IPv6 address. For example, look at this address, where on the left side, the second group has 05B8, and there is a zero in front. On the seventh group, you see that there is a 0, 3, A, and a 0, where a 0 is in front. So these two zeros can be erased, where the 0 in front of the underlined 5, B, 8 will be erased, and the 0 in front of the 3, A, 0 can be erased. In addition, the zeros in the middle for the fourth, fifth, and sixth group, which are all zeros, all zeros, and all zeros, these can be represented by two consecutive columns. So therefore, it would look like this, where the 0 in front of the 
5B8 is removed. The 0 in front of the 3A0 is removed. And also between the groups of 4, 5, and 6, which are all 0, 0, 0, 0, 0s, these can be changed into this type of a format. IPv6 addresses that are frequently used, we start off with the unspecified address. This address has an IP address that is all zeros. All 128 bits are zeros. That's why we have two columns representing that. And then we have a slash 128, which means that all 128 bits of the subnet mask are 1. This is used as an unspecified IPv6 address. In IPv4, this would be equivalent to 0.0.0.0 slash 32, where all bits in the IP address are 0, and all bits in the subnet mask are all 1s, represented right here. For a default route, we use this notation, where all bits in the IP address are all 0, and the slash 0 represents that, all bits in the subnet mask are also all zero. And this is used as a default route in routing tables. This would be equivalent to the IPv4 address of 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, .0, 0. Also, there is IPv4 mapped to IPv6 addresses. And you can see that the way that the notation is done is right down here. Now, there are a few exceptions that do apply. These are the references that I used, and I recommend them to you. Thank you. The UDP protocol. UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol, and it provides port information for application connection. It is a connectionless protocol, which means that UDP does not establish any end-to-end -end connection manager to check on the received packets. The port is the most important function that UDP provides, and it provides information of the source and destination ports. For example, the destination port and the source port over there, when you identify these two, then the applications connected to that specified ports are connected through UDP. The length field contain, contains the length of the entire UDP segment, which includes the UDP header and the data. The checksum field is used to detect bit errors in the UDP header. Checksum uses the same error checking algorithm that is used in TCP and IPv4 headers. If an error is detected, the segment is discarded and no error recovery is taken. Use of the checksum field in UDP is optional, and when it's not used, then this field is set to all zeros. These are the references that I use, and I recommend them to you. Thank you. The TCP protocol. The TCP header has a minimum length of 20 octets. The TCP header contains various data segment flow control functionalities. The checksum field is used for error detection code that is added to protect the TCP header from errors. Checksum computation is done in this way, where a TCP pseudo header is created. As you can see over there, that includes the IP addresses, reserved, protocol, and TCP length fields. Then the TCP header is also used, and the TCP data is also used overall together to compute the checksum. So the TCP header contains the checksum field. So therefore, initially when it's computed, the checksum is computed, that checksum field is set to all zeros, then this is all computed, and then the computed result is placed in the checksum field for protection. The data offset field is a number of 32-bit words in the TCP header. The minimum TCP header length is 20 octets. When additional options are used, padding may be added to make the TCP header a length of 
a multiple of 32-bit words. And the padding would go into this area right here. Now, the reserve field is reserved for future use. And we have the source and destination ports. Frequently used port numbers are for FTP, FTP control, Telnet, and some other numbers that you can see are for SMTP, private printer, server protocol, DNS, HTTP, and there's others. The push flag is a push function represented as PSH. Here, when PSH flag is set, which means that it's equal to 1, then it pushes the data segment to the receiving application. Push enables the received data segment to be quickly used by the application. What this means is that at the receiving device, segments of payload data will be added and added and combined. And when a certain amount is accumulated, then that is delivered to the application within the receiving device. Then the application can use it for to serve the application that is being used. However, when the push flag is used, then even before that certain amount is not accumulated, when, as it comes in, it is delivered to the application to be used immediately. So therefore, that's the, the function of how the push flag operates. In addition, for urgent services, there's what we have the urgent flag. Here, when the urgent flag, the URG flag is set, which means that that one bit is equal to one, then it indicates that the urgent pointer field is used which is the pointer field right here. The pointer field points to the urgent data location within the payload segment down there. Here, it enables the receiver to know how much urgent data is coming. And the SN, which is the sequence number, and the UP, which is the urgent pointer, basically, from these two numbers, you can see that the urgent data's last sequence number can be identified. These are the references that I used, and I recommend them to you. Thank you. For the chapter, Internet Routing and Functions, we will now look into IGP and EGP. IGP stands for Interior Gateway Protocol. It's used by gateways to exchange routing information within inside an autonomous system. An autonomous system could be like a corporate network, campus network, or an internet service provider network. EGP, Exterior Gateway Protocol, is used by gateways to exchange routing information between outside ASs. Routing path selection is based on network policies, network administrator configured rule sets. Currently, the internet uses BGP4, which is Border Gateway Protocol version 4, that was published in 2006. IGP categories include link state routing protocols and distance vector routing protocols. IGP examples include OSPF, RIP, ISIS, and EIGRP. Among these, Link state routing protocols and open shortest path first, first, these technologies are used most frequently, and therefore we will focus more on them. Border gateway protocols have external BGP and internal BGP types. This is used for BGP routing between ASs, and internal BGP, IBGP, is used for BGP routing within an AS. Now, BGP security is an issue because BGP routers commonly belong to different internet service providers. And therefore, each router may use a different encryption and security scheme. Routers and gateways are administered and managed by different internet service providers. So security coordination may be difficult. BGP routers need to exchange setup and updated information with each other. Now, if poor coordination happens, then security vulnerabilities will occur. When different encryption and security schemes are used, it can be difficult to authenticate and protect against spoofed BGP messages and various malware attacks. 
OSPF, Open Shortest Path First. This is the most widely used IGP, Interior Gateway Protocol, for routing in the internet. It is used for IPv4, IPv6, and CIDR notations. It is used by internet gateways and routers. And it uses link state routing algorithm. The way that it operates is routers collect link state information from other routers in the AS network. Then network connection map, a tree, is made which includes the cost values of all the links. Tree routes from the source node, which will be my node, and my node, I'm going to create a tree, a routing tree, to all other nodes in the network, and it will start from me. So therefore, my node, which will be the source node, will be the root node of the tree. And it will branch out and make connections to all other nodes in the network. The link state routing algorithm is used to set up a shortest path tree that has no loops. Now, a loop can create a big problem because a packet could go into a loop and just go around and go around and also it will exhaust the resources of the routers in that that are connected to the loop. So therefore loops are not desired. So therefore we want to create a loop free shortest path tree that shows all the routing paths from the source node to all the destination nodes that I can use. Here, SPT the, will select a minimum cost routing path using Dijkstra's algorithm. The gateways and routers will set up and update their routing tables based on the SPT. When changes in the network are detected, then step 1 through 4 will be repeated. OSPF link cost factors include distance of a router, round trip time, the number of hops to reach the destination, the throughput in terms of bits per second, packets per second, or bytes per second, availability, and reliability. The shortest path algorithm works in the following procedures. M is a set of nodes connected to the shortest path tree. Now initially, it starts with no members, so basically I'm the only member within the set M. We want to find the least cost route and we want to find it from the source node, which is my node, to all the other nodes in the network. And when we calculate the link cost value to a certain node, I will be adding up the link cost values following a path that is already selected using the nodes that are in set M. And I'll show you an example to clarify this up. In addition, whenever we select a minimum cost node, it is added to set M, and we want to record the least cost route from S to node X. We will repeat these procedures from 3 to 5 until all nodes in the network are a member of the set M. Here is an example. For this network, this node S is my node, and that's why I'm the only one that's included in the set M. I'm going to compare all one-hop connections that connect to node 1, 3, 4, and 2, and the link cost values is 2, 5, 5, and 3. Among these, the minimum one is 2, so therefore I select it. And it becomes a member of set M, and now it is connected to my shortest path tree. The first node is connected. Now, when I calculate the next set of values, and I'm going to do a comparison to add the lowest cost one. I need to make sure that the connection over here, it, although it's a two, to connect to node three by node one, it goes through this link value of two. So actually the two plus two results in a value of four. So it should be represented as a four. So it's a four, a five, a five, and a three. So therefore among these, three is the least cost, so therefore, Node 2 is added to the shortest path tree, and node 2 is added to set M right here. In the next step, we see the other numbers, and among them, the value 4 at the top is the, the lowest cost, so therefore node 3 is added on, 
and then we compare again. We see that 9, 5, 9, and 13 are compared. The least cost, the minimum cost, is this one right here, 5, which connects to node 4. So therefore, it is added to the shortest path tree, and node 4 is added to set M right here. Then, among the other options, we compare again. And the least cost, which is the link cost of number 9, which connects node number 6 to the shortest path tree, is selected. And therefore, it is added here, which you see right here, number 6. Then, we do another comparison. And you see that there is a value over there, which is 12, 10, and 13. 10 is a minimum one over there, which connects to node 7. So therefore, that link is connected to the shortest path tree. And you see right here, node 7 is included inside set M. Then, among the other options, we add the link, which is the 11 over there, which connects to node 8. And therefore, it is added right here. Then, among the remaining connections that we want to connect to the remaining node, node number 5, well, the options, you see the two values over there, 12 and 13. Among the options that connect to node 5, the route through node number 7 is the least cost 1, which has a cost value of 12. And therefore, that is added on to the shortest path tree. And by that being added on, well, now all the nodes, including node number 5, is all included into set M. And the algorithm is able to stop. And the shortest path tree is established. The routing table, you can see right here, where you can see the source node S, the destination node, which is written from and to, the 2, which shows all the nodes within the network, and the route that is used to go through the shortest path tree. OSPF router types. We have internal router, IR, area border router, ABR, where an IR, where all routing interfaces belong to the same network area. And in an ABR, this connects sub-area networks to the backbone network. There is also a BR, a backbone router, which connects to the backbone network. And we also have an ASBR, which is an autonomous system boundary router, which connects between ASs using multiple routing protocols. Routers may have multiple type functionalities. MOSPF stands for Multicast OSPF. It is an OSPF extension to support multicast routing. It enables routers to share group membership information in multicast routing path setup. Alternative multicasting schemes do include OSPF with PIM, which is Protocol Independent Multicast. OSPF subdivided networks. This is a division based on administration and management requirements. It is used to simplify administration, optimize traffic and resource utilization, enhance security, and enable faster routing updates. OSPF network subdividing results in sub-area networks and a backbone network area. OSPF traffic engineering. This is traffic engineering quality of service routing control of IP packets from ingress node to egress node. Traffic engineering enhances reliability by minimizing service outage from errors and failures. Traffic engineering enables measurement, characterization, and modeling for performance optimization of internet traffic. Traffic engineering can be used for IP and non-IP networks, which optical networks are a representative example of non-IP networks. Address Resolution Protocol, ARP. ARP maps an IPv4, IPv6 address to a device's data link layer address. For example, an Ethernet MAC address can be mapped to an IPv4 address. IPv6 uses NDP, which is Neighbor Discovery Protocol for ARP functionality. So, for example, NDP can be used for Wi-Fi MAC address to be mapped to an IPv6 address. ARP is defined in RFC 826 and Internet Standard 37.
the IANA manages ARP parameter values. Here are some ARP packet parameters that are used. And as you can see, there's hardware type, protocol type, hardware address length, protocol address length, operation, sender hardware address, sender protocol address, target hardware address, and target protocol address. These are the things that are included in an ARP packet. Network Address Translation, NAT. There are two types of NAT, one-to-one -one NAT and one-to-many NAT. One-to-one -one NAT is known as basic NAT, and it enables interconnection of two incompatibly address assigned IP networks. For example, if there's an address structure within a company that is used and an address structure outside, well, typically, the address structure outside may have a problem when connecting to address an IP address within the company network. And therefore, this is when basic NAT, one-to-one -one NAT, can be very effective. One-to-many NAT is also known as IP masquerading. An address space that includes many private IP addresses can be hidden under a single public IP address that is used externally. For example, these private IP addresses may be using one representative IP address when they connect to the internet. Some of the advantages of one-to-many NAT include it provides enhanced security, and also it was made such that we could save public IPv4 addresses, which we are running out very quickly. RPC, which is Remote Procedure Call. In RPC, this is a program that enables a function procedure to be executed on a remote computer. It enables easy programming as if the function is to run on a local computer that is currently being used. Recovery procedures from unpredictable network problems are needed. RPC request and response procedures include a client initiates RPC by sending a request message with a set of parameters to a remote server and the server replies with a response to the client. FTP, File Transfer Protocol. FTP is used to transfer files from a server to a client computer. It is used over TCP IP based upon the internet standard RFC 959. FTP sign-in protocol commonly requires a username and a password. And FTP with TLS, transport layer security protection, which we call FTPS, is commonly used. FTP modes include active mode and passive mode. In FTP active mode, a client sends a FTP command port M to the server to inform which port to use. Server sends data from its FTP server data port to the client's port. FTP passive mode is used when the client is behind a firewall and cannot accept incoming TCP connections from the server. The client uses the control connection to send a passive command to the server. The server sends its IP address and server port number. The client opens data connection to the server IP address and port number. FTP active and passive modes were updated to support IPv6 and enhanced passive mode in RFC 2428. FTP data transfer modes include stream mode, block mode, and compressed mode. Stream mode is TCP is used to send data in a continuous stream, and FTP does minimum processing. In block mode, FTP divides data into blocks and uses FTCP to transfer. In compressed mode, data compression, for example, run length coding, is applied. Enhanced data transfer techniques exist. 
email. Now we're going to compare POP3 and IMAP. They are both email retrieval applications that use TCP and IP. POP3 stands for Post Office Protocol version 3. IMAP stands for Internet Message Access Protocol version 4. Encryption through TLS and Start TLS or SSL can be used. POP3 has a very simple operation. It moves emails from the server onto your device. POP3 can be set to leave emails on the server after being retrieved. In IMAP, IMAP enables complete management of a user mailbox on the server from multiple email devices, such as your PC, your smartphone, and your notebook computer, your laptop computer, and other devices. IMAP is more popular due to multiple device support. IMAP uses more complex queries because it needs to support multiple devices. It leaves emails on the server after retrieval, and it's left there until the email is deleted by the user. SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. It is an internet email protocol. It is text-based, and it uses TCP IP. It is commonly used to send and receive emails between servers. These are the references that I used, and I recommend them to you. Thank you. Hi. For the course Introduction to TCP IP, this chapter is about internet security. And it's going to deal with the following four topics. Top ranking, internet attacks, growing security and threat issues, internet and cyber attacks, and internet security and protection techniques. For the course Introduction to TCP and IP, this chapter is going to focus on internet and cyber attacks. And we're going to start off with the first lecture, which is on top ranking internet attacks. Now, if you look at this pie chart, this is from the 2016 McAfee Labs, which is the threat report that has the top seven network attack types of quarter four in 2015. And as you can see, from this wide blue area, that is 36%, it starts off with browser attacks. Then it has Bruce brute force attacks, denial of service attacks, SSL attacks, scans. Then it has DNS attacks, backdoor attacks, and the others combined for overall 9%. Let's get into some of the details. We'll start with browser attacks, which is ranked as number one and has a dominating 36% of the overall number different types of attacks. And this is where Attackers disguise malware as an application or an update, and a technique called phishing is used. I have a separate lecture on phishing in this course, and so therefore I'll explain the details at that time. The browser users are tricked into downloading the hidden malware, and the browser intruded malware attacks the operating system or the application on your PC or your mobile device. And it can be defended by updates to the browser, operating system, and applications. Then, brute force attacks ranks as number two at 19%, where repeated attempts to decode a password or a PIN number is attempted brute forcely over and over again. Easy common passwords are tested. In addition, what we call a dictionary attack is also attempted. What is this? Well, all the words in a dictionary are actually used and see if this is actually your password. It can be defended by frequent and well-selected passwords, and you change them frequently, and also by avoiding logging in too frequently. Then we have denial of service attacks, DOS attacks. This ranks as number three at 16%. Attacks a computer, a server, or network to block communication and services, to denial the services that it normally should be operating on, it should be providing. 
attackers overload target with more requests than the target system can handle. A common targets are online banking, email, and commercial websites. A DDoS attack, which is a distributed denial of service, uses multiple distributed computers to conduct the DOS attack. This can be defended by antivirus software, firewalls, and email filters. The next we have is SSL, Secure Sockets Layer Attacks. And this ranks as number four at 11%. SSL is used to set up a secure encryption protected link between a website and a browser, as well as an email server and the email user's application. Now, in early connection stage, the SSL attacker will intercept user information. And they will try to look what is going on before this information gets encrypted and exchanged. What are they looking for? Well, access passwords, cookies, authentication tokens, and other things. Attackers try to gain sensitive data, such as credit card information, social security numbers, and other things, and use that for other type of attacks. Then, we have scans. This ranks as number five at 3%. Attackers scan for open computer ports that can be used to gain access to the computer. Attackers repeatedly send messages to computer ports to find security vulnerabilities. And scans are commonly used before launching an attack onto a computer, a network, a server, or a comprehensive system. Next, we have DNS attacks, which are domain name server attacks. This ranks as number six at 3%. Now, DNS is used to change domain names into IP addresses. And DNS spoofing, which is also known as DNS cache poisoning, is an attack that changes the domain name's IP address to a wrong IP address. DNS spoofing is used for DNS hijacking. Well, DNS hijacking is used to redirect a user to a bogus website or the hacker's computer. And the dangerous and scary thing about this is that the user does not know that they're connected to a bogus server or they're connected to the hacker's computer. This can be defended by using a random source port and updating server security patches very frequently. Next, we have backdoor attacks. This is ranked at number seven at 3%. Now, a backdoor is a computer remote access application. It is used by developers and administrators. And it is powerful because it bypasses the security system. In other words, if a developer needed to go and fix a bug in his program, then it would need to go through the back door to go in and access the entire framework of programs and then go and fix it and then be able to come out. This is what a back door is used for. So it gives you direct access to the core software, to the core control capabilities. So therefore, if a hacker was able to get in through the back door, you can imagine the amount of damage that could be made by that act. Hackers try to gain access through malicious backdoors in hardware or software components. And it's defending by updating your security patches. These are the references that I use, and I recommend them to you. In this lecture, we're going to look into growing security and threat issues. Number one, botnet. Botnet is robot plus network, where the bot and the net part are combined together. Multiple devices are used to conduct internet attacks by the botnet owner, which is the attacker. The types of attacks that are conducted are DDoS, stealing data, sending spam, or doing intrusions. And zombie computers are used frequently as botnets. A zombie computer is a hacker-compromised computer connected to the internet. And 
the scary thing about it is that the user may not be, may not be aware that his or her computer is actually a zombie computer. So the process can be done so covertly that the user may not even know. The next one is zero-day vulnerability. And a new zero-day vulnerability is discovered almost every day. Zero-day attack is an attack on the vulnerability of a web system that commonly results in disabling of web services. The terminology of zero-day refers to the day that a critical system, network, software, or platform vulnerability was patched such that the web operations was restored and thereby day zero has started again for the services. Then we have browser and website attacks. The key thing is that browser and website attacks will be attempted no matter what. If you have a browser, if you have a website, then yes, unfortunately, eventually at some point it will be attacked. That's the sad truth. Attackers are always looking for vulnerabilities in browsers and website plugs in, plugins. And vulnerabilities are found in three quarters of all websites. Now, the other thing is that repeated attacks. Companies that are attacked once typically are almost always attacked again. This is the sad reality. In other words, if you're 100% going to be attacked and then almost guaranteed to be attacked and attacked again. So therefore, you can see that bigger companies get much more attacks. Of course, they do. And also, ransomware is increasing rapidly. So therefore, you have to really be careful on how you defend and provide network security. In addition, the issue of reporting. Companies are not reporting all security breaches and attacks that they have received. Billions of personal records are lost or stolen, and the company's reputation is damaged very seriously. That is one of the reasons that they know that they've been breached, but they will not announce it. Another reason that is even more scary is that the company may not know if they've been breached or not. In addition, they may not even know how to recover. If it comes like this, then you really have to worry. So therefore, the effort that you need to put into security and threat prevention is significant. Where should my website be hosted? How am I going to protect it? These are some of the issues that we need to consider in the future. These are the references that I used, and I recommend them to you. Thank you. Now let's look into internet and cyber attacks. We're going to start off with phishing. Hacker phishing around to obtain resources and information by disguising as a trustworthy entity is what we call phishing. And typically email is used. And the information types that are hunted around are for usernames, passwords, credit card information, and money. Now, phishing emails commonly contain attachment files and web links that are infected with malware, so you have to be very careful. Spear phishing is one type. Here, phishing to an individual or a company. And it uses personal information of the individual to increase the success probability. In other words, with personal information about you, it can fool you. In addition, most common and successful type of security attacks are phishing, where it accounts for over 90%. And I'm sure throughout the process, you may have experienced this, as I have several times. The second type is clone phishing. Here, legitimate previously delivered email is resent to the to the receiver containing an attachment file or a website link that is infected with malware. It fools the receiver as if it is an update or a replied email. Then there's whaling. Now, this is a phishing attack made on a high-ranked executive of the company to attack important business files using executive-level access. 
Now, because this is a big fish, this is why we call it whaling. Now, link manipulation. Here, phishing website link that is infected with malware or connects to a hacker website. It looks like a popular, legitimate website link. Now, the hacker's web address is disguised under text or a tab that is not shown. The next phishing type is filter evasion. And in here, phishing emails that use images instead of text to avoid anti-phishing filters used in security systems. Then the next type is website forgery. In here, phishing website replaces the user address bar or website with the hacker's address bar or website. The user is fooled into providing important login information, password information, and account information to the hacker. The next type is covert redirect. In this type, this corrupts a website to have a malicious login pop-up dialog box that covertly redirects a login to the hacker's website. So after login, you're giving up your important information. In addition, you're logging into a website that you're not supposed to. Next is social engineering. This provokes a user to click on a malicious link or a hacker's website. In other words, it uses fake news to provoke a user. And then once you are logged into a hacker website, then basically you are under the hacker's control. The next type is phone phishing. In here, a telephone call or an SMS text message to trick people into giving up personal information is the way that the phishing attack is made. Next, we're going to study about DOS and DDoS attacks. Here, DOS stands for denial of service, and this is a very popular type of an attack. This is a cyber attack that disables a device or a network by making operational resources unavailable through overloading or malfunctioning. The next one is a distributed DOS attack, which is called a DDoS attack. And in here, the DOS attack is made by using multiple distributed systems, which are botnets or zombie computers or other type of computers that are contaminated with malware. Now, these DOS and DDoS attacks are created, are enabled by other type of technologies that are combined together. And I'll explain some of them in the following descriptions. This is overflow. And as you can see, buffer overflow, which is also known as buffer overrun, this is used in DOS and DDoS attacks. Anomaly program, which is a malware, this overruns the buffer boundary and overwrites into adjacent memory locations. Now, some of the possible defense schemes that you can have include randomizing the layout of your memory, deliberately leaving space between buffers, also monitor actions that write into adjacent memory spaces, and two representative types of buffer overflow are stack overflow and heap overflow. And let's look into these. Now, stack buffer overflow is created by a manipulation of a local variable related to the vulnerable buffer on the stack, manipulate the return address in a stack frame, manipulate the function pointer or exception handler to create operation malfunction, or to manipulate the stack frame's local pointer or local variable. Then there's heap overflow. This is used in dynamic memory allocation. And the heap is used for applications in runtime. The heap overflow is a buffer overflow that occurs in the heap data area. Now, protection methods to prevent heap overflow include to separate the code and data to prevent execution of the payload. In addition, randomize the heap location so it is not located at a fixed offset position. In addition, periodically check the condition of the heap. And all of these methods are commonly applied in operating systems and apps that you have been using. The next one is about man-in-the-middle attack. Now, a man-in-the-middle attack secretly relays and manipulates packets between communicating users and servers. 
This results in an active eavesdropping and manipulation of the information. Now, defense against man-in-the-middle attacks include enhanced authentication using a certificate authority based on verified certificates from a trusted third party. In addition, latency examination based on tamper examination. What this means is that if there's a man in the middle that's taking operation and relaying, then there should be some extra time delay processed due to the process of the man in the middle. And if you can detect that, then maybe you can detect the man in the middle. In addition, HTTP public key pinning, which is also known as certificate pinning, is another way to do it. Some extra details are, the HTTP server first announces, pins up, a list of public key hashes that can be used for message and data encryption. Next is SQL injection. Now, SQL stands for Structured Query Language, and it's pronounced as SQL. What is it? Well, this is used for RDBMS and RDSMS processing. Now, RDBMS is Relational Database Management System, and RDSMS stands for Relational Data Stream Management System. These are database technologies. Now, SQL injection is a code injection technique used to attack SQL databases and data-driven applications. Attacker finds security vulnerability in an application and inserts SQL statements to spoof identity, tamper with existing data, voiding or changing transactions, changing account balances, disclosure of data, destroy of data, ransom data and applications, in addition, hijack administrator role of the server or the application. And as you can see, each one of these are very serious. These are the references that I use, and I recommend them to you. Now let's look into internet security and protection. We'll start off with intrusion detection systems. Here, an IDS, an intrusion detection system, is a system that detects malicious activity and policy violations in network devices. The detection results are reported to the network administrator or the SIEM, which is the Security Information and Event Management System. Now, false alarms are removed by the alarm filters, and that's actually very important as well, because if you have too many false alarms, then that will keep you distracted. That will not be able to keep you focused on the important attack issues that are occurring. Now, the types of IDS systems are now introduced. First, host IDS, which is HIDS. This operates on host computers, laptops, smartphones, tablet PCs, and it monitors all internet packets sent and received by that device. In addition, status snapshots are taken and compared with its former status. Next is network IDS, and in here, this operates on selected gateways, routers, and switches. It consistently monitors and detects abnormal behavior. The next is signature-based IDS, where this searches for specific intrusion patterns, such as malware sequences that are very difficult to detect individually, but more detectable when you detect a typical pattern or a sequence. In addition, there's anomaly-based IDS, where the detection scheme for new unknown attacks are dealt with here, such as new malware behavior. And for this, we need machine learning monitoring system, which is used to detect new patterns, which means that we need artificial intelligence. And this is where we monitor to detect new patterns because these patterns have no previous records. So based upon typical patterns that we do know before, we need to look into the future to predict if this is or not a new pattern of an attack. And that requires some artificial intelligence, typically machine learning technology. Now, the next type is the more advanced type, which also not only does detection, 
but also has some type of active prevention mechanism. What is it? Well, this is what we call an IDPS, an Intrusion Detection Prevention System. It is an IDS system combined with an intrusion counter response system, which can do disconnection activity. This topic is about firewalls, which is a critical part in internet security and protection. Now, network security monitoring and control system is what a firewall is. It monitors all transmitted and received packets, and of course, IDS systems are included. Now, there's network-based and host-based. The network-based firewall is in the gateway, and it does network protection. Typically, it's in your local area network, wide area network, and also it's in the gateways, the routers, and the switches. The next one is the host-based firewall. It's in your computer operating system. It's in the endpoint, which is your smartphone, your PC, your laptop, your tablet, your pad device, and other things as well. Next, these are the generations, the evolution of firewalls. And it starts off, of course, with the first generation, where packet filtering of network addresses and ports are done here. In the second generation, we have stateful filters that were added for IP packet and transport protocol inspection. When I say IP packet, I'm talking about IPv4, IPv6, and for transport protocol, I'm talking about TCP, UDP, RTP, and other protocols as well. Now, this tracks all state changes in these protocols. And all of the first generation protocol techniques, which are these ones, these filters, are included in the second generation ones. Now, third generation. And these are the ones that we use today. These also include application layer filtering techniques, which include HTTP, DNS, FTP, behavior detection, and it's observing what's going on. Now, all 1G and 2G techniques are, of course, included. In addition, deep packet inspection, DPI, is included. And also, the IDS technique, more evolved one, which is the IPS one, which is the intrusion prevention system technique, that's included. In addition, user identity monitoring is included as well. And also device MAC address and reputation monitoring is included. And also web application firewall technology is included as well. In this lecture, we're gonna talk about TLS, which is transport layer security. Now, this is a network cryptographic protocol to enable secure communications. Now, this was defined in 1999, and it was updated in 2008 and 2011. This replaces the SSL, the Secure Socket Layer Protocol, and that was defined in 94, 1995, and 1996. Now, the current uses a 2048-bit encryption, and this has been used since 2013. Now, of course, extensions in the future will occur. TLS provides privacy and data integrity between network applications. It uses symmetric cryptography and uses encryption keys generated uniquely for each connection. Now, at session setup is when the TLS handshake protocol is done to set up these type of encryption keys. Now, public key cryptography is used to authenticate the identity of the communicating system. In addition, a message authentication code is used to ensure that data integrity, which is to prevent alterations, is actually processed by TLS also. Now let's study about wired equivalent privacy. This is a security algorithm developed for 802.11 wireless local area networks. And this includes Wi-Fi. This is WEP was designed to provide data confidentiality equivalent to the security level used in wire networks, which makes the wireless equivalent at a level of wired. And that's where the name came from. WEP includes encryption and authentication techniques. Now, the Wi-Fi Alliance announced that WEP will be replaced with WPA, 
which is Wi-Fi protected access in 2003. So now let's go and study WPA. In WPA, this is a Wi-Fi Alliance developed security protocol and security certification program. WPA uses TKIP, which is Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. And this dynamically changes the encryption key for each and every packet. Now, WPA is an improvement to WEP, but TKIP can now be broken. So new enhancements are needed. And that is why we have WPA2. And this is the current WPA version that is commonly used. WPA2 certification is mandatory for all Wi-Fi devices since 2006. Now, WPA uses CCMP, which is an AES technology. It's an advanced encryption standard. Now, CCPM stands for Counter Mode Cipher Blockchaining Message Authentication Code Protocol. And that's a lot of words to stuff into four letters, but they did it. Now, WPA2 includes all mandatory elements of the IEEE 802.11i standards and requires Wi-Fi Alliance testing and certification. Now we're going to study about SSH, which is Secure Shell. This is a cryptography protocol to enable secure services over unsecure networks. The applications include remote command line login and remote command execution and various other secure network services. SSH2 is commonly supported by all servers. These are the references that I use, and I recommend them to you. Thank you. For the course, Introduction to TCP IP, now we're going to go into the Wireshark Internet Project. We'll start off with how to install Wireshark. Now, first go to the website wireshark.org slash download, and then download the Wireshark install file according to your operating system. And as you can see here, these are the options that are provided. Next. Double-click Download File to start the installation process and click the Next button down there. Click the I Agree button to accept the license agreement to use Wireshark. And then choose the components to install and click the Next button down there. Now, which components? Well, as you can see over here, I recommend select all of the components. Next, select options to create shortcuts for Wireshark and select the file extensions you want to connect to Wireshark and click the Next button down there. Now, choose the installation location, which is the destination folder location on your computer for Wireshark and click the Next button down there. Select the Install WinPCAP option to capture live network packet data and click the Next button. Now here, WinPCAP stands for Windows Packet Capturing. The next step is to wait until the installation is completed, and then click the Next button, as you see down there. Now, now you need to reboot your computer to finish to complete the installation process, and that is what you see down there. Now, now you're ready to go, and we'll start the experiment on the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to study about how to check your IP configuration on your PC or your laptop computer. Now, we start with first opening the command prompt window. In a Windows 7 based computer, you can click on the window button, which is the button down there, and all programs, accessories, then go down to the command prompt, what you see right here, and then you'll be able to open the command prompt window. In a Windows 10 based computer, you can click on the Window button, which is the button down there, and then you can go through the options of All Apps, Windows, System, 
then command prompt, which you see is right here. Now, if your computer has a keyboard that is a Windows key included keyboard, which is the one that you see right here, then in Windows 7 or Windows 10, by clicking on that Windows key and also the R button simultaneously, it will automatically open up the run box, as you can see right here. And if you type in CD, CMD, which stands for command, and then click on the OK button, then you will get the command prompt window like this. The next step is to type ipconfig into your command window that you have right here. And that's what I did over there. Then you will get a lot of information as shown in the red box down here. You will get your IPv4 address, IPv6 address, in addition, your subnet mask, default gateway, and more information as you can see down there. You have some options to use, and among them, the slash all option is most powerful. It gives you all information related to your IP configuration that you are going to use on your network. And you can see all the information down there. In addition, here are some other options that are more advanced. The release option. To release your PC's current IP information and obtain a new IP address from the DHCP server. Then there's the renew option to renew your IP address. You can, it can be used if your PC is set to automatic IP address setup mode, which uses DHCP. The display DNS option, which is to show your current DNS resolver cache logs. Then there's the flush DNS to flush or clear your current DNS resolver cache logs. And then there's the register DNS to update the DNS settings on your PC. Another pow powerful function is the ping command. And you use it in a way where you can test the round trip time from the source PC, which is your PC, to a specified destination PC or a server. Now, the target address that you can write in up there is actually, you can use the target destination's IP address or you can use the domain name. And here we're using the domain name of www.coursera.org. And the information as you see down here will show up. Also, ping has a variety of options. The A option is used to resolve the host name of an IP address target. The N option, it sets the number of ICMP echo request messages to send. Now, without this option, four requests will be sent. Then you have the L option, which also includes, you need to include the size information. This is used to set the size of the echo request packet from 32 octets to 65,527 octets. Remember, one octet is one byte. Now, without this option, a 32 octet echo request will be sent. Then there's the I option, and it is used to set the time to live value. The time to live maximum value is 255. There's the W option. Now, this is used specifying a timeout value when executing the ping command. It adjusts the amount of time in milliseconds that ping waits for each reply. Without this option, the default timeout value is 4,000 milliseconds. Then we have the P option. It's used to ping a Hyper-V network virtualization provider address. Now, another powerful tool that we have is the trace route. And this command is used as trace RT, and then you put the target address. And you can see that right there. Now, it displays the route and measures the transit delays from the source to the destination. The target address can be an IP address or a domain name, like the domain name we're using right here, www.coursera.org. Now, what happens? Well, this is the type of information that you can obtain. First, each row represents a hop along the route. And the hop number shows the number of hops along the route. Then the RTT shows the round trip time. 
and the trace route checks the round trip time three times for each hop. Then there's the name slash IP address, and it's the domain name or IP address for the router. There's the option of H, which includes the max hops, and it specifies the maximum number of hops in search for the target. There's also the W option with timeout to specify the time to allow each reply before timeout in milliseconds. These are the references that I used, and I recommend them to you. Thank you.